We're in John chapter 6. Open your Bible there, please. John chapter 6. <clears throat> I knew when I started looking at this chapter in John that we were going to take some time to get through it because there's a lot here. I mean, there's, there's actually 71 verses in this chapter, but um, more than that, there's just a lot of incredible information that is here. And so uh, this is our third part in this, uh, in this chapter. We're picking it up in verse 22, John 6, 22, and we're going to read down through verse 47 this morning, and then, Lord willing, we'll take the rest of it next week, all right? Here we go, verse 22 and onward. On that, or excuse me, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side, oh, for some reason, my laptop just decided to go all the way to the bottom, Hang on. All right. Um, all right, here we go. I'll start over. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Let's stop there. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we approach these verses this morning and uh, do our level best to unpack them here and, and see what they are saying, Lord, we, we open our hearts to you today that you would fill us with grace and insight and understanding. Lord, we just want to have open hearts and we want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice. We want to learn from you. We want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, Lord, we come to you to tell you that we are dependent upon you to accomplish that. We pray, Lord God, 
that we might have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts ready to receive. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what we're reading about here in these verses here, uh, today is the day after, the day after the big uh, uh, miraculous feeding of the multitude, uh, the 5,000 men. So they didn't count women and children. Who knows how many people there, there were. Anyway, the people woke up the next day and Jesus was nowhere to be found. Now they remembered that there was only one boat that had been uh, on the shore there on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee and they knew that Jesus had put his disciples into that boat and sent them on across the lake to Capernaum and uh, Jesus had then gone and dismissed the people to the local towns or wherever they were going to camp out or uh, whatever for the night. They all get up the next morning. They go searching for Jesus and he's nowhere to be found on that side of the lake. And they're wondering what happened. So apparently during that early morning hour, some of the some boats came and landed there on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so uh, they got into those boats and made their way across the sea over to Capernaum uh, to look for Jesus and ultimately found him. It says in verse 25 that when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, you're going to notice here as we read through these verses again that Jesus doesn't answer their question. He just goes on to talk to them about why they are there and what they're looking for. Wouldn't it be, I mean, you know, can you imagine Jesus giving an answer? Well, here's the deal. I put the disciples out and sent them home and then a storm came up. So I walked on the water. And I got about halfway across the lake, freaked those guys out. They thought they were seeing a ghost. So I told them, don't worry, it's just me. I got in the boat and suddenly we're at the other side of the lake. Anyway, how are you guys doing today? Sort of a thing, you know? No, he doesn't say anything like that. What he does say is he just begins to speak to them about their motives. Look what he says in verse 26 in your Bible. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. In other words, not because you saw the power of God manifest through the miraculous multiplication of, of bread and fish. And you, and, and, and you wanted to know about what God was doing here. That's not why you're here. He says, you're here because you ate your fill of the loaves. And so with that single statement, he exposes the motivation behind their coming, which was essentially to fill their bellies. They got a free meal out of the deal the day before, and now they wanted some more. So Jesus exhorts them, saying in verse 27, and this is, this is an important exhortation. I'll encourage you to pay attention here. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, some Bibles say that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Notice there are three things essentially that Jesus is saying. Number one, he says don't work for food that spoils. Number two, instead work for that which lasts, which the Son of Man will give you. And then thirdly, he says on him, referring to the Son, God has set his seal, or if you will, his stamp of approval. But I want to focus here this morning for just a bit on this first point that Jesus makes, and that is don't work for food that perishes. Perhaps a better translation or rendering of that word work would be don't strive. Don't strive for food that perishes. Um, Jesus is essentially warning us that the things that we strive for, often at great physical, emotional, and financial cost, all have one thing in common. Do you know what it is? They're temporary. Everything we strive for, everything this side of heaven, everything on earth that we strive for is temporary. Now, please understand, that's all we know. I mean, apart from God communicating to us that there are things that are eternal, that there are things that are lasting, right? We wouldn't know. I mean, how would we know of everlasting or, or, or things that have a lasting value? If you didn't have God telling you that, how would you know? Because you don't know of any, I mean, in your, in your scope of reality, there's nothing that lasts. Everything ends. 
everything comes to an end, right? We live on this planet upon which everything at one time or another passes away. And yet Jesus comes along and he exhorts us, knowing, as he does, that there's nothing that we know of in our life that lasts forever. And he says, rather than striving after things that are going to end, why don't you strive after things that are going to remain? You know, and, and, and at the face of it is almost kind of an absurd sort of a proposition. But what Jesus is doing is he is revealing to us a different reality. One that frankly we wouldn't know again without him sharing. And that is there is a place where things don't pass away. Isn't that crazy? You know, it, it's funny. Like I said, there's nothing in this life that doesn't get old or break down or stop working or whatever. And yet we get mad when things break down. Isn't that crazy? As if, as if we've ever experienced in our entire lives anything that lasted, you know? You have a mower and it stops working. You're like, man, I just bought that thing three years ago. And it already stopped working. And it's like, what'd you expect? This is, this is life. This is life on planet Earth. By the way, it wasn't always intended to be that way. You do know, correct, that God created this world originally not to wear out. He did not create death. He did not create things that were going to stop working and become just only temporary. God created things to last. He created everything and he said, this is good. What happened? The introduction of sin into mankind's realm of existence brought about the temporal aspect of life and things like death and destruction and corrosion and, and decay and, and all the other things that enter into uh, this place where we live on earth now become our reality. And, and so things are no longer eternal here on earth. They are temporary. They, they don't last. And yet heaven retains God's original design of the enduring and the timeless continuation of life. And Jesus is not only making us aware of the fact that there is a place where things last, which I know is a mind blower, but he's also inviting us to participate in that in the way that we can actually store up things here that, or there, that will last. You guys remember he talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Let me put it on the screen. Matthew chapter six. Do not, Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth where things are gonna just, you know, moth and rust, uh, destroy and where thieves break in. I thought, I thought moth, I thought that was like old time, ancient type stuff until I pulled, um, I had these sweaters and I pulled one out of my closet. It had holes in it. And I'm like, what the heck? I couldn't figure out where these things came from. And I showed it to Sue. You know, she's like, well, moth or, you know, some critter. Man, alive. He says, or thieves break in and steal. Ever had somebody break into your home and take things? He says, but instead live for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Wow. This is a revelation, you guys. There's a place where these things can last, where good things can last. But Jesus makes it very clear that the, the difference between the place where they last and the place where they don't last is built into the nature of those two locations, earth and heaven. The nature of earth now because of the fall of man into sin is that it is temporary. The nature of heaven is that it is eternal and it is lasting. And we have an opportunity to store up things uh, where they last. No, okay, so this is a great comment. I mean, this is a great thing that Jesus is teaching here to the people. Let's see if they're gonna get it. Verse 28, here's the response of the crowd. And then they said to him, Okay, what must we do to do, be doing the works of God? This is it. You can kind of tell things just kind of went right over the head sort of a thing. 
But this is, you know, this is kind of just the response of people in general for the most part. When we hear about the blessings that God wants to give, we go, okay, well, what do I got to do? Just tell me what I got to do. And there's a natural tendency inside us as human beings to think this way, to think that, you know, here's the blessing, so what do I got to do? I've even had people say to me, okay, this Christianity thing you got going on here, what do I got to do? Give me the rules. Just give me the rules, lay out the rules, and I'll do it, and then, you know, and it's not about rules, you know, it's about faith, but we just naturally gravitate, right, as humans toward this thing like rules. Have you ever wondered why legalistic churches are as popular as they are? Because they still exist. I mean, the Jews fell into vast legalism during the time of Jesus, and he had to confront it constantly. But, you know, it's not like Jesus came along and legalism went away. Legalism has continued for, the, you know, a couple of millennia since then. And, and there, you, you can still, some of you might have come. Your background might be some very legalistic style churches. And what I mean by that is they're based on rules. I had a gal write me this week and she said, I've been hanging out with these Christians and they say that if you don't wear these certain kind of clothes and never wear uh, jewelry and you only wear your hair this way, you know, you, you can't go to heaven. And those were the rules that they laid out. She said, is that true? And so I had to write her back and say, well, that's a legalistic church you got there, sweetie. And you need to go find a place where they're teaching the word of God and not misinterpreting it. But, you know, this is, this is, this is, but have you ever wondered why people just still are drawn to that? Listen, there's something very comforting knowing what to expect. You know? There, there is. It's, it's, it's comforting to have somebody tell you, all right, here, here's the deal. If you do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, you're good. All right, there you go. Okay, now I know what I need to do. You know, and, 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 and Christianity becomes what we do or what we don't do rather than what we believe, which is what the Bible says it's all about. So anyway, notice our Lord's response to their question, what must we do? Here's what he says. Jesus answered them, run around the church six times really fast, give 15% of your income to the Lord, and be a very good person at least six times a day. All right, let's close in prayer. No, that's not what he said. He said, this is the work of God. And by the way, I want to emphasize this verse for those of you that have recognized in your life that maybe you have that gravitational pull toward performance Christianity. In other words, doing things so God is going to bless you or love you or accept you. Here's what he wants you to do. He, he says that you would believe in him whom he has sent. And there it is. That's the work that he wants you to do, which is no work at all because it has to do with faith which is not a work. He wants you to believe in the one whom God has sent. Now, he's not saying that your obedience isn't important. It is. He is saying, however, as the other New Testament authors say, your obedience won't save you. Your obedience can't save you. What saves you is your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, he's telling them this, right? And this is a pretty big thing to swallow. Hey, believe in me. Yeah, that's the work of God. You want to know the work of God? Believe in me. All right, fine. Verse 30, so they said to him, great. All right, we hear what you're saying. Now, what miracle can you do to prove that everything you're saying is true? And that is really the response they're giving. They're saying, what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What, what, what work are you going to perform so that we're going to believe what you say? Now remember, <laughs> this group of people is largely made up of the same group that just ate miraculous food less than 24 hours ago. They were involved in a pretty spectacular miracle. And yet here they are once again saying, all right, that's an interesting thing to say. How, well, what are you going to do to back it up? We want to see a miracle. And they even go on to give him a suggestion. Can you relate to that? Some people, we do that in our prayer sometimes. We say, Lord, I need to pray about this. And then we proceed to tell him what we think he ought to do to answer our prayer. So they go on, verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And they're quoting Nehemiah to, to Jesus. 
right? Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. That's not the real bread. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is, I want you to notice this next word in your Bible. It is the personal masculine pronoun, he. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Boy, you know, you'd think that would be pretty clear. Jesus is saying, listen, the bread of heaven is not a thing, it's a person. It's he who comes down from heaven. They didn't get it. Verse 34, then they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. <laughs> Doesn't this sound a lot like the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well that we did in, in John chapter 4? Remember the situation there wasn't bread, it was water. And she comes to the well to get water and he starts talking to her about living water. And he starts trying to get her eyes off the material water and onto the spiritual thirst that we all have. And she, as she listens to him talk and then she says, sir, give me this water that I will never have to come back here again. It's very similar to what these people are saying. Lord, give us this bread always. Well, so Jesus now has to speak a little more clearly about what he's talking about. And he's going to do that here in verse 35. But I want to just prepare you for what's coming. Because in the next several verses here, verse 35 and following, Jesus is going to say some things that we need to pay attention to. Because he's going to say a lot about who he is. And he's going to also say a lot about what he came to do. And those are important things for us to really latch on to. So here comes the clarity now in verse 35. He's, he already told them the bread of, uh, of heaven or the bread of life is he. And they're like, yeah, so give us this bread. We're hungry. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You can't get much clearer than that. Whoever comes to me, Jesus says, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And those are some pretty bold statements for somebody to make. I am the bread of life. I am. But he comes right out of the chute and tells him. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this statement, and we're going to ask the question, what is Jesus doing by making this statement? What is he saying? What does he mean? Well, he's obviously addressing, like he did with the woman at the Samaritan well. He's addressing the issue of their immediate need. She came for water. Let me give you living water. They came for bread. Let me give you the bread of life. But by referring to himself as the bread of life, Jesus is using a word picture here that was very important and would have been clearly understood by the people of the day. I don't know how well it translates today. I mean, we still eat bread and all that, but it's probably not as big of a staple in our diet as it was, you know, back in, in, in those days. You know, people kind of, they talk about bread a little bit disparagingly today. You know, it's, oh, those are carbs. I don't do carbs. I do carbs. If I, if I turn to the side, you can tell. But, um, you know, for people in Jesus' day, this was absolutely huge because bread was one of the essential foods of, of, of the culture. Certainly it was a staple in the diet of the, the Jewish people. And that's why Jesus is using this picture to speak of what he offers spiritually. Because, because of the fact that bread was essential to their diet, he is making the point that the bread of life, me, I am essential to your spiritual existence. That's the point. There is no eternal life apart from me, just as there is no continuation of life without the staple of bread and so forth. And he, and he gives them these wonderful promises in verse 35 that are equally clear. And he says that if they will partake of the bread of life, the promise is they will no longer hunger 
And if they believe, they will no longer thirst. But what are those promises predicated upon? Because they are conditional promises. Well, he says it right here. Whoever comes to me. Whoever comes to me and whoever believes in me. Do you know that that's it? Boy, that's just, that's the essence of the gospel. You, you know, we have, we have taken the last 2,000 years to muck up the whole idea of what it means to be a Christian. And, and if you want the simple definition of what it means to be a Christian, it's the person who comes to Jesus and the person who believes in him. That's it. And we get all these things that we, you, you got to do. And if you go to church and you do it, and, and a lot of these other things are good in and of themselves. You know, read your Bible, go to church, you know, worship with other believers, you know, pray. Those are all wonderful things, but they don't necessarily make you a Christian. You have to come to him and believe. And that's why Jesus says, whoever comes to me will no longer hunger. Whoever believes in me will no longer thirst. That's what it takes. Let's not confuse it. It's really quite simple. Being a Christian is really pretty simple. Okay? And I like, I like when Jesus gets simple. He goes on to say in verse 36, But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet, he says, you do not believe. So the people that were there listening to Jesus, they still didn't believe in his words. They still didn't believe in what he was saying. They weren't there yet. So he says in verse 30, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. There's two statements here that we need to see. First of all, Jesus says all who the Father gives will come. And then secondly, he says, and when they come, I'll never turn them away, nor will I ever cast them out. So you come to Jesus, you know that you know that you know he's going to accept you if you come to him. And then in the following verses, we have this beautiful expression of the gospel, verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is going to talk a lot here about God's will. So we need to pay attention. He says that it is God's will that he came to lay down his life for sinful mankind. Verse 39, he says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Now pay attention to verse 40, this is important. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So several times here, Jesus speaks of the will of the Father. And by the way, it's always good news. We take it for granted that the will of the Father is good news. But this is definitely good news. But did you notice in verse 40, he said, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And then check this out. He says, I will raise him up on the last day. So let me ask you a question. Based on verse 40, Who's going to raise up your physical body on the last day? Jesus. Didn't he say that? He said, that's the will of the Father. And I will raise him up at the, those who believe in me have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Right? So Jesus is the one who's going to raise you up on the last day. By the way, whenever the Bible talks about resurrection, it's always talking about your body, Okay? It's not talking about the essence of who you are. That will be merged with your body. But listen, when you, when you die, if the Lord tarries and you end up expiring first, you will go immediately into the presence of the Lord. Your body will be raised. You, the essence of you doesn't get raised. You go to be with the Lord. But your body, you're going to be given a new body someday. So understand that, please. Resurrection always refers to the body, not the spirit and the soul. Those things immediately go into the presence of the Lord. So who's going to raise up your physical body? Jesus. Now that's kind of interesting in light of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. Let me show you on the screen. Chapter 1. <clears throat> Indeed, Paul writes, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But he says all that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on, oh, look at here, God 
who raises the dead. So according to Paul, who raises the dead? God. But according to John 6, 40, who's going to raise you up? Jesus. How is that possible? Because Jesus is God. You can't come up with any other conclusion. Otherwise, you got problems with your Bible. Jesus is God, and he is going to raise you up. He is going to raise the dead. So Jesus shares the good news as he does the will of the Father. You know, but there's always people who just can't accept things and they have to grumble and complain. And that's what happens here. Verse 31, so the Jews grumbled about him. And they said, oh, he's saying I'm the bread that came down. Hey, how can he say I'm the bread that came down from heaven? How can he say that? And they, they even go on to say, isn't this, isn't this Jesus? Didn't, we watched him grow up. We watched him from the little tyke grow up right here. And we know his, his father and his mother. So how can he say things like, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them in verse 43, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who has sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. There it is again about raising up and who's going to do it. But we're reminded in this passage something very important about our salvation, and that is that it begins with God. Notice what Jesus said. Nobody can come to me unless the Father draws him. So where does your salvation begin? Sometimes I think we Christians, we, we give ourselves the credit. We think that we thought of it all ourselves. You know what? I think I need to get saved. You know, I, I'm, I'm just getting more and more convinced that I'm a sinner. And you know what? I think Jesus is the Savior. So here's what I'm going to do. And we think we got that all figured out and we did it all on our own. Fact of the matter is nobody can come to Jesus unless he's been drawn. There is a drawing work that goes through the work of the Holy Spirit. But here's the question. Who is drawn? Who is drawn? I have to tell you, because I've been a believer now for a while, I think that we waste a lot of time asking questions, frankly, like this. I really do. In fact, I think people waste a lot of their time talking about situations or, or debating things that they just can't truly know. And, and, but, you know, I, 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 get, I get notes from people from time to time that will say, you know, Pastor Paul, I, I believe in Jesus and I... I, I I know that, you know, he died for the sins of the world and I've accepted that, but how do I know that for sure that I am the one who was drawn and how do I know that I've been chosen? And I'm kind of like, as if they're going to get to, you know, the gate of heaven one day and God is going to be checking off the list and come to them and go, oh, sorry, you weren't chosen. <laughs> sorry. You know, and then hit the button, you know, that... Shook. <laughs> as, as if, I mean, it's ridiculous. It, 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 it really is it, uh, ridiculous. I, so so who, who, who is drawn? Well, I can tell you this for sure. If you recognize today your sin, and you can very easily and openly say, I am a sinner. And if you likewise recognize the fact that Jesus is the Savior and he's yours, I can tell you with absolute confidence, you have been drawn. You've been drawn. So is Jesus saying here that some people will never be drawn? Is that what he's saying in this particular verse? I got to tell you, I personally struggle with that conclusion. And I struggle with it, not just because I don't like it, but because it flies in the face of other scripture. And you know, when we're interpreting the Bible, you know, the best way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible, right? 
smartest, best way is let the Bible interpret itself. And there's a passage that Peter wrote in his second letter I want to show you on the screen. And it goes like this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. And I highlighted this next phrase, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So what does this passage tell you? It tells you it is the will of God that none should perish, but that all, and those are conclusive words, would come to repentance, any and all, right? Now, that's really all you need to know. That's it right there. We can really stop the debate. And we can just say, well, you know, there's one thing I know for sure. God wants everyone to be saved. Does that mean everybody's going to be saved? No, sadly it does not. But God's will, he is not willing that any should perish. He's not willing. It's not his will. He wants people to come to repentance and to a saving knowledge of what Jesus Christ did on the cross when he died for your sins. He wants that. And, and frankly, I think that we can rest in that and we can leave the rest of the debate in God's hands, right? But it all comes down to faith. It all comes down to faith. Um, I run into a lot of people that don't have peace with God on the score of salvation when it comes to you know, talking about their salvation, they're just not sure. They're just not sure. And the reason they're not sure is because they just can't figure things out. And they keep asking questions and they, want, they keep asking question after question after question after question trying to get uh, the right answer that's gonna give them peace. And I try to explain to people that you don't get peace from getting right answers. You get peace by believing in God's love more than you believe in your ability to figure it out. That's where peace comes from. That is where rest comes from. If you're one of those people who struggles in the area of peace and rest as it relates to your salvation, stop trying to create an intellectual reason to rest or to have peace in God and trust by faith that God has you and he's not letting go. That's what's going to bring you peace. That's what's going to bring you rest. It is not an intellectual pursuit. It is the pursuit of faith. You know, there's so many things that just kind of boggle our mind, but at the end of the day, I have to trust in God's love above and beyond all those things that boggle my mind. And just say, you know what? Where, where, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And I'm just going to trust in you. All right, last three verses that we're covering this morning. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets. Jesus is speaking here. And they, that they, and they will all be taught by God. He's quoting Isaiah 54. He says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. And he's saying something pretty important there. He's saying, only, only I have seen the Father. Truly, truly, here it is. Here's the gospel. I say to you, whoever believes, that's putting your faith in Jesus and his finished work, has eternal life. These are such important just last few verses, but I want to end with this statement and, and just talk about this for just a moment. The statement in verse 45 where Jesus says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Oh, but Pastor Paul, how do I know if I've heard and learned? And this is something, again, I hear. I, it says here that everyone who has heard and learned, but I don't know for sure if I've really heard and if I've learned. And so I just ask him a few, couple quick questions. Do you know that you're a sinner? Yeah. Okay. Do you know that Jesus is the Savior? Yes. Then you heard and learned. 
That's what he wants you to know. I mean, you know, we strive for a lot of other sort of information, but he wants you to just get the basics down. You're a sinner. He's the Savior. Boom. And, and if you got that, you've heard and you've learned. You know, and not that there aren't other things to hear and learn because, you know, we grow up in our salvation and we grow in the grace and knowledge and we move on from infancy into adulthood in our spiritual lives. But where you begin to hear and learn is the simple reality. I am a sinner. He's the Savior. I accept him. I accept what he did on the cross. And I know that I know that I know that I am saved. Not because I'm a good person. It's because he's good. He's a good God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to have some folks down front here to pray with you if you need prayer this morning for whatever reason. And Heavenly Father, I want to just pray this morning here as we close. If there's anybody in this room or who's, been, who's watching online who just hasn't said the words out loud, Jesus, I receive what you did for me on the cross, then I pray, Lord God, they would do that right now. Even if it's in the quiet of their heart, Lord, I, just, I receive what you did for me on the cross. I believe. And I, I believe that salvation is not based on me being a good person or getting it right or figuring out every nuance of all of the debates that are going on. But I believe that salvation is based on faith alone through the grace of God. And I accept it today. And I ask you, my Father God, to give your children rest and peace from the knowledge that they are in Christ today, that they have heard and they have learned and they can now go forth and grow in that knowledge and mature in their faith to trust in the Lord with all of their hearts, leaning not on their own understanding, but acknowledging you in every circumstance of life. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for your powerful, redeeming word. And we commit our hearts to you and our lives to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all God's people said together, amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your Sunday.